Howdy, howdy, everybody. Welcome to OfficeHours.fm, episode number 115. I'm your host, as always, Carrie Dills, and I am thrilled to be here with you today, whether you're tuning in live or catching this after the fact. Uh, I've got a very special guest on today. His name is Travis Dandinord, and he is actually... Hey, Travis. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Good. Uh, so Travis is the husband of uh, Chrissy Vandenord, who is... Uh, tunes into the podcast and uh, just cool. Like now I'm meeting families and I'm, I'm bringing families on the show. So this is, uh, this is awesome. Um, a couple of notes before we dive into uh, today's show. Um, a reminder that the officehours.fm community is now completely free to join. Uh, head over to, if you haven't checked it out yet, head over to my.officehours.fm and check it out. Get in the conversation with other uh, folks who are tuning into the podcast. Uh, we, we've got some forums over there. We also have a Slack group where you can uh, interact with other folks. <clears throat> and then, this, is, this may sound like sad news, or you may actually do a dance of joy. I don't know. Uh, next week will be the last episode of season two. Going to take a little break, recoup, uh, and then coming back season three later uh, later in 2016. I'll keep you posted on the dates there. But, okay, if you're tuning in live and you have questions for Travis, uh, which I'm pretty darn sure you will, uh, get your fingers ready on Twitter. Use the hashtag OfficeFM, uh, or you can use the Google Q&A app if you're uh, watching from, from over there. So, all right, without further ado, hello again, Travis. Hello. That was a lot of words coming forth uh, very quickly there. So I'm going to take some deep breaths, <laughs> center myself. Um, so Travis, so already already mentioned that you're uh, you're you're married to Chrissy, and then the two of you have a, uh, a business adventure together called North UX. Am right. I yeah, right. Cool. Um, well, so we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit in the show. But for people that uh, have not stalked you on Twitter, which by the way, your name is awesome. It's Tito Von, wait, Tito Vande? Is that how you? Yeah. Yes. Tito Vande. Yes. Yes. Like I kind of want to take a shot of tequila. Long time. So yeah, it's almost like a, it's almost like a, a mixed drink of sorts. But uh, yeah, it's my uh, college nickname and my friends in my hometown still refer to me as Tito, which I'm not even sure how that derives from traps. It just kind of happened. So it's it's been something I just, most of my handles usually have that as a, as the moniker and it's that way it's uh, easy for people to track me down I guess I don't know it just kind of morphed from an odd reality I guess I like it so yeah yeah so tell tell folks a little bit about uh, who you are and what you do sure um, well I like you said I'm Travis and um, I'm a English teacher I teach AP literature. Um, most of the time and uh, basically my job is to teach people how to write and teach people how to read correctly which is becoming more of a challenge as time goes on uh, which has been fun, kind of fun to kind of watch young adults kind of morph into this interesting culture of their own writing that it's very very odd um, and just trying to get them back to being able to communicate effectively beyond emojis and snapchat which is is interesting to say the least but um so i spent a lot of my time uh reading and uh i used to i used to write a whole lot more and then we had kids and i hardly write at all and so uh we're just kind of in this nice place of uh where i just kind of get a actually spend my spare time helping christy with north as being the kind of head communications person um, so I just basically take my job and turn it into how to develop uh, templates and emails and things like that for, for her that she can use through throughout um, business hours and things like that. So um, it's kind of it's, it's a fun challenge to be able to try to communicate with uh, a clientele versus students. And so I've, I've been really enjoying that. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, and we're just kind of moving forward with, with North. Uh, if you check out North UX right now, we just have the a banner up saying it's going to launch soon, but probably the next two weeks the website will be up. And um, I think I mentioned earlier, Chrissy will be speaking at the Loop Conference in October. So we're really excited where we're going. And uh, I'm glad that uh, 
my years of education are paying off in something other than a classroom. So that's really good. So that's kind of where we're at. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, well, um, well, Ooh, I've got an echo. I think it's me. Let's see. You still hearing it? I don't hear an echo. I think I'm good. Okay. Uh, that was technical difficulty number one for the show. We're going to try to hit at least five technical difficulties before the hour is up. We can do it. Um, <laughs> I, it's yeah, it's, it's important to goal set. Uh, wow. That AP English is actually quite near and dear to my heart. Um, yeah. yeah, it, I actually ended up APing out of, uh, all lower level English classes in college. So while all my buddies were t toiling over their papers, I was out playing and not I just working. Make, I just make kids toil earlier in life and then they just don't have to do it in college. So it's a, it's kind of an interesting dichotomy where uh, you're convincing these students that, hey, this is gonna make your life easier in college, but I'm making their life a whole lot harder in high school. So it's, uh, it's fun, it's fun, they learn a lot, so. By the time they leave, they don't complain too much. So it's, it's a good thing. They'll love you later. Uh, or at least I, I still love my English teacher. This is neighbors. Uh, okay, so let's let's dive in and the, how, I mean, I, I knew of you because you were Chrissy's husband, but the, the way it came up is this could be uh, a great podcast topic was she, you were helping her uh, craft an email to a client. Um, so I want to actually start right there with, with email. So kind of the written word, um, right. maybe, uh, like from your perspective, what, what makes, what makes a good email, a good sure. piece of communication? Um, emails are tricky, you know, cause we have, a, we have, you have different kinds of people trying to communicate and they're trying to be genuine and they're trying to be themselves and they're trying to get information across. Um, so you have some people who get wordy and they have a page long email when it probably could take a paragraph. And then you have other people who throw out like three sentences and you're like, I have no idea what you're, what you're even trying, trying to get to on this. And then you have what I call style issues. And so in a good email, especially when from a business standpoint, you, you want to be direct um, about what you're talking about. You want to give them the information that they need without a whole lot of emphasis on, you know, the place to have to put your two cents in typically isn't in an email, it's in a conversation. Like, here's this, I think this, 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 and this, is just gonna muddy the water for them. And so they're just gonna be kind of like, okay, so do you think I should do this or do you think I shouldn't do this? I'm not really sure. And then also just from a standpoint of like, I'm a big believer that emails are incredibly, like not, formal to the extent of like an essay, like type writing, but formal from the standpoint of, um, for Chrissy, she has a bad tendency to use what I call jargon or slang. And I'll be like, you know, you can't, how, like things like, how y'all doing? Like, I don't, don't, don't write y'all in an email. Like, just don't do it. I go, it hurts your credibility and, and things like that. So, um, actually she says, you guys, not y'all, you guys, how are you guys doing? And, you know, I'm always just kind of like, well, what if this goes to a female? Do you want her to say, how are you guys doing? Or how, what are we doing here? So, um, so in a good email, typically it, the communication is going back and forth. From the get-go, we kind of know where we're going, like what the questions are that are being asked or what we're trying to get across. It's getting that information across in the most clear way that you can um, without being overly wordy. Um, if somebody has a question, you know, like with stuff I deal with Chrissy is that she's talking about um, – you know, something from a standpoint of how something's going to look. And it's like, she can go into all the nuances of it and say like, I'm trying to be clear so they know everything that's going to happen. Or I, you can say, here's what's going to happen. You're going to have questions about this. Let me just answer your direct questions and not give you a page of information where you only have two questions out of, on two sentences out of the 42 that I present. Um, they know what they want. They, most people know what they're looking for and they know how to respond. So in a good email, I say if it's over a half a page, you've probably written too much. Um, unless it's like a, like something immensely important that has lots of layers to it. Uh, typically, once you get past the half page, you should be picking up what I say. That's kind of the pick up the telephone line. If you need to go past that, pick up a phone and have a conversation. Um, you're not gonna gain a whole lot of ground by overwhelming the information in the written 
form and expect positive feedback or positive kind of uh, relationships through an email type situation. Um, so there's that balance, and I find this especially with Chrissy um, and other web designers is email and um, IM channels and those kind of things are their go-tos for communication. And so when I tell her you need to pick up the phone, she gives me the recoil of like, what is a phone? And why would I call somebody? Like, that's weird. And it's like, well, we're kind of hitting that mark and, and we're kind of moving that way. So in a good email, you want to, you know, you don't have to do a whole lot of intro if you have a relationship going. You're basically saying like, here's the answers to the questions you had. Here's a, here's a clear way of we, in which we can do solutions to that or what we're going to do. Um, I threw some information out at you. I'm sure you have some questions. Shoot me an email back. We'll keep dialoguing. Um, so that's that's effect that's effective emailing is the transfer of information. Uh, and one of the big reasons for that is I won't keep drowning on here. Is one of the big reasons for that is when you go to look for these emails later, if you have a very um, convoluted style of writing, I don't mean that in a negative way, but if it's very complex and and there's lots of stuff going on, you're writing page 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 and have emails. Finding those emails become a lot more complicated. Uh, you know, you're like, oh, what was that email where you asked me that one question? And you find yourself serving through a ton of emails. If you keep it compact, usually within a search, you can find that email relatively quickly. Um, it's kind of that, it's a catch-22 of, you know, sometimes when you feel like you don't get enough information out there. But you'd rather have somebody respond with questions than to let them feel like they're overwhelmed with information. And then they're kind of like, well, I'll get back to you when I, I have something else I need to say. So the goal is to keep dialogue going. That's the whole point of email communication is you want to have, you want to have that, that dialogue that continues. We don't want to drown somebody in, in our response typically. Kind of like I'm doing now, I'm kind of drowning because I keep kind of going on here. But still, uh, we're just kind of... You've just written me a three-page email, man. I wrote like a three-page email and uh, probably put footnotes in it and everything. So I mean, it's just, it's just a horrible email. Well, would you, would you recommend like keeping to one topic in an email? Like let's say that uh, I got multiple things that I need to discuss with you, right. but they're kind of wildly different topics. Uh, do I make a, an email for each topic or lump them all in or what's your suggestion there? Uh, it the, the breadth of it. Like if you're, you have a lot to say about a lot of things, you're going to, there you're gonna have a person who's gonna whatever your first point was by the time they get to the end they're gonna be like I don't even remember what was going on there like um, I know for people it seems like a kind of a pain to kind of be like oh I gotta send like three emails to carry today but the nice thing about doing it that way is that it also works to your mental faculties the brain has a hard time shifting gears uh, especially when it comes to different changing subject matter and this is this is from my teaching standpoint this kind of come from You'd much rather do a complete single email that covers one topic and gets that taken care of than have three things and then when you send it you go, oh yeah, I forgot about this because I was thinking about these three things at, at the same time and trying to get this all into one email and I need to email them again to say, oh, I forgot this. And so you're actually still sending two emails versus if you just are like, okay, uh, we have this website that we're dealing with over here. I'm going to send an email that just talks about that so that when Say my wife is who you're corresponding with. Chrissy goes, oh, um, you know, I can just look at this one email and leave it up here and work on this website. I don't have a whole lot of other things going on here. And then I can just respond to those questions quickly versus, well, I only have time to respond about this top thing. I don't have time to respond about this middle and this third thing. Then the, re the response kind of comes back as you go, well, did she read the rest of it or does she not care to respond about this? You're kind of giving them a place to process it and give you better feedback if you s split them up and separate them out. No, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, you know, you just got to kind of, you, I always operate under the, fat, the function of how's a person going to be able to respond to this and how are they going to be able to take in this information? If they're going to be in a place where they're going to be, like my wife gets overwhelmed with information on a regular basis. Like if I hit her with three things, I better give a good 30 minutes of her to process before I come back and say like, okay, what do you think? If I hit talk about one thing, the conversation continues on pretty well. Um, Is this the episode where we get to throw Chrissy under the bus? 
No, because she already told me she's going to tweet you and fact check me on anything that I say wrong. So <laughs> I am um, being very careful. I'm from the standpoint of like being pretty straight. Like these are how I how I process these things. Um, you know, I can put in for my students as well, but it's kind of the same same kind of thing. People are built to to process and um, intercept things on a one by one piece. If we start overwhelming people, that's when we start getting these cross communications. They're half answering part of that question. They're half answering part of this question. You're actually making more work for yourself long term because you're going to constantly have to be bouncing back and forth, and it gets to the point where all of a sudden you're like, "Do we even talk about the third piece? Like, do we need to go back and revisit that?" And then you're rewriting another email to say, "Hey, we never talked about part C. What's going on there?" Where when I look in my inbox and I see, okay, Carrie Dill's on this website. Okay, I know exactly what that's going to be about. Uh, Carrie Dill's dinner plans. Great. I know that's going to be about, I don't need to get to part B as quickly as I need to get to part A. And then at the same time, you're not feeling put off when I don't respond to your answers. From a, from a business to client aspect on that, that's a big deal. Because if a client feels put off, they're going to start to draw back. And then that's where you start seeing that collision of, well, that wasn't made clear, and I didn't understand what was going on here. And um, we just want to, as from a business standpoint, we want to avoid that as much as possible. We want there to be like, you know, I sent you an email specifically on this. I sent you the email specifically on that, so that when they go, oh, I, fr I think I did get an email about that, they can just type in North UX website, which was the thread that was going back and forth, and just pull up that versus. Was that under the one like, are we getting together? Or was that under the one that was, you know, do you have this file? I can't remember where we talked about that. And so good subject lines. Right. Right. Like those are good subject lines that often lead to confusion. And so we wanna as a from a business owner standpoint or even from a contractor standpoint, you always want there to be that clear delineation of this is specifically what I'm talking about. If you ever feel like an email is starting to sway away from that, start a new email. That's the other big thing is we kind of get in this whole click and reply, click and reply. And then all of a sudden this one conversation morphs into something else. And then all of a sudden we're like, I can't find these things. And being able to find the that information is important as getting it to them in the first place. Uh, thank you for that. If you are just tuning in, I'm chatting with Travis Vandy Nord. He's an English teacher and a lover of words, and we are talking about uh, client communication and how uh, specifically writing emails to, to get the, the right information uh, that you want. Casper, I hope that answered your question. Um, Jackie has a question. She says, so if you're on a phone conversation, uh, or you, you have a phone meeting with someone, do you recommend following that up with a little email, like with the yeah, I mean, so summary or to-dos? You can. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I, it, I mean, you're going to have to read your client on, on those kind of things. If they are a person who, once you have a conversation, they remember it and, um, you know, there's not a back. Like, if you need something from them, absolutely follow up. Like, if you're like, okay, we're going to leave this conversation here, but I need this and this and this from you at some point. Um, don't just assume that they're going to do that because you had the phone conversation. You're going to want to follow that up with an email. Maybe after a couple days, hey, just checking in. Want to see if you had any more, you know, like, are, the, are you working on getting these things to me? And then also, is there anything, any questions I can help you figure out any of this stuff on? Those kind of things. When am I going to hear from you a little bit? We're not trying to be forceful on it, but we want to keep that train moving as much as possible. So you're going to have to read your client a little bit. If they're somebody who's pretty proactive and you have the conversation, they do what you kind of want them to do. Um, no, no, you need to overly bog down their inbox. If they're a person that you say asking for something or there's a conversation that's kind of left hanging and after a week you haven't heard much, like absolutely. Like here's a few things that we talked about. Here's the things I needed from you. Um, are there any hangups or is there anything I could do to help you know move that along? Um, you know, you always want to kind of come from that idea that you're helping them. Never come from the idea of like, hey, you're supposed to get this to me. But those kind of emails are good from a standpoint of it keeps people on track. Um, but, you know, I had students that if they come talk to me in my classroom, I can leave it at that and I know that what I said is going to be done. 
there's other kids I'm like, I'm grabbing in the halls, I'm walking down the hallway every two days going like, you're going to get this to me, right? It's kind of the same thing on that follow-up. You just want to be careful that you're not um, making them feel babysat in a way. So I have some students that if I say something to them too much, they feel like I'm babysitting them and they kind of are like, I just don't want to hear from you right now. <laughs> and you kind of want to avoid that that area as much as possible. Um, you know, know give people audience. time. Yeah. So um, it's nothing wrong with a follow up email after a conversation. Um, you no, know, there's nothing wrong with a follow up phone call either. If you're more comfortable on the phone, just touch base them on the phone as well. So um, you know, I, you don't have to keep notes. It, it, to answer the question, I don't know if you need to keep notes for them and like send like a bullet point to here's the things we talked about. Um, but if you're following up for uh, needs or uh, to answer questions that didn't get taken care of, that that should be fine. Um, and I always wait. I always wait about forty-eight hours on that, somewhere in that range, range, um, unless they're expecting it earlier. So you mentioned the word templates earlier, uh, and I'm I'm not sure if you meant it in this context. But do you guys use canned responses or uh, like say for client onboarding or? Uh, for new inquiries that would come into your website? Um, well, I mean, it's kind of a yes and no answer to that one. Um, there are some canned responses, which are what I call information responses. So if I'm sending out something that's like, I'm going to send to every single client, and I'm basically just changing the name of the client, and I'm changing the name of the project, and it's saying things like attached, you'll find the, the uh, contract or you'll attach, you'll find the estimate. Please look this over and get back to us. I'm going to absolutely can those, like put them, save them into your email. All you got to do is click on it, change the name, send it off. It's going to save you an immense amount of time. Now, if you have a new client that's inquiring through a website, um, depending on what you kind of read, I, I tend not to, to lean towards canned responses in those situations. The problem is, um, you want to kind of connect them on a, a little bit level and sometimes they'll give you a little bit enough information that you can kind of throw in a little bit, try to make that connection on the initial email. Uh, they're just wanting information from that standpoint of if you have interest. Um, and if they get a canned response, that's no different than them opening their email and being, getting one of those emails to say like, hey, you've never heard of us before, but I'd love to do a website for you. and there's no personal, there's no connection there. So on an initial, I would probably, my guess would be, there might be some phrasing that I use on a regular basis that I might have canned and that sounds odd. So what I typically do is if I know that we're gonna have an onboarding or a, let's just say, let's do an introduction, an introduction email. I might have a, um, a Word document that has several different paragraphs or several different phrases or several different responses. That will be a chunk of my email um, but I will not have it in a situation where it's the majority of my email. And so the reason that's important is I can say a lot of similar things in different emails and have those responses canned, like here's what the process looks like going forward. Do I need to rewrite that every time? No. Does my introduction paragraph need to be pretty much tailored to that, per to that company or that person based on what information I might have? I'm going to lean that way so they don't feel like they're getting the robot response. That makes it a whole lot easier for them to hit the trash button than it is for them to hit the reply button. Um, you just want to, it doesn't have to be like this big, big connection. You know, you might just see they're from, you know, Orlando, Florida, and you're just like, hey, we love Orlando. We take our kids to Disney World every few years. And then they realize that they're not talking to a machine, and that's all it really takes. But a lot of the chunks of it can be canned. And, I do recommend if you find that you're doing a similar type of email on a regular basis, say you do 15, 20, 30 introduction emails a year, there's nothing wrong with having a Word document that has chunks of responses that are built in that you can cut and paste into an email. Um, and then having those templates for like your contracts or your, your estimates. You know, you just want to be really careful um, from the standpoint of, you want to be efficient, but you don't want to be impersonable. Um, that's that's the big catch twenty two of that situation is it could be super efficient, but then they don't feel like that their business is important, and so then you kind of lose them on that front end of 
you know, you forget to fill in their company's name. It says company name here or something like that. Like you just don't want to have those issues happen. Um, oh, oh yeah. I got an email the other day and it said, Hey Sue, let's connect on LinkedIn. And I'm like, Sue, Sue, who the hell is Sue? <laughs> and then I realized that what he was probably doing, and I, it turns out like I do know a Sue and they were connected on LinkedIn. So I, I, I think he was maybe just like copy pasting, copy pasting and forgot to <laughs> swap out the name. Right. Uh, so yeah, I, I, did, I don't think I accepted that connection. Um, right, it feels plagiarized. <laughs> when you get in that place, you're like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. It's, that's, you know, we're, there's nuances to writing that seem really silly to a lot of people, but you know, what we're finding here at North is that, you know, the language that I typically try to use in the email does have a really positive effect on the outcome. Um, from standpoint of you know you're 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 keying in on what that person does or who that person is and you're trying to kind of hit a I don't want to say a heart string but you're trying to hit a, uh, one of their core beliefs or principles about why you'd be a good fit for them and you know for some people that informal kind of speech doesn't sit well with them for other people it feels like a robot's talking to them and you send them a canned response that's really nicely written and formal, it's going to miss the mark as well. So if we're hitting for that middle gray area, which is I'm going to try to connect to you on a personal level just for a second and then give you the information you need to move this process forward, we're going to see a, we're going to see the fruit kind of gather from that a lot faster um, versus, you know, I can, my wife could have me set a computer and write the most beautifully written initial email great big, nice, big English words and really formal sounding stuff. And, you know, I would bet that's going to miss the mark at least 50% of the time. And so uh, where it doesn't miss the mark is when you just really just mix that blend of here's the canned response stuff of what you need to know versus, hey, as a client, I have interest in who you are because I want to work with you. No, that makes, that makes sense. Well put there. Um, Chrissy is trying to elicit a particular story from you. I, I have a feeling. She says, talk about sending an email and getting someone to respond in a way that might not have been their default. Like, I, actually, I, I don't know what example you're going to I think she, I think she what she's talking about. I don't know, I, I guess. Um, so I think she wants me to talk about how, because she's brought, brought this up a few times as we've been preparing for this, is just the whole um, – you know, how do you get somebody to actually respond versus getting the, them to just read your emails? And so you want to, an email, a good email elicits a response, you know, even more than just the thanks. Like, thanks for sending me that. Like, you want them to engage in a conversation. Like, electronic, like, email is meant to be electronic mail, which is based on the idea of letter writing from earlier, where people actually use pens and paper, which nobody even knows what those are anymore. And you know, it goes back and forth. So I think the story she's talking about is she was trying to contact uh, somebody from a church in the, in our area, um, contacted her about possibly taking it. She wasn't sure if they're asking her to contract or take a job, like an actual job with them. Um, wasn't interested in taking a job with them at all. Like wasn't even on the radar. She didn't want to go into this church and be their, you know, web person or whatever the job description was. But, you know, my response is, well, I think we can kind of wheel them around on this a little bit. And um, she started, you know, writing up an email and I'm reading it kind of popping in over her shoulder. And I'd be like, mm, don't say that. Don't say that. Um, the big deal that I think she wants me to get, and I'm not sure if this is where she's going to go with it, is, is from a contractor slash independent business, small business standpoint, people are terrified to lose potential business. There's, there's, it's scary. Like, I don't want to say something and then all of a sudden it doesn't work out. Um, or be like, Hey, I got this lead and it didn't pan out. They, they want to have a high success rate. And so the language that's used in those kind of emails is what I call soft language. If you might be interested, if you, if you like to talk about this some more, you know, if, if you really want uh, to meet, I could come down. Like, 
there's a lot of ifs and lots of if you want and if um, you know if this sounds good to you. Um, part of the job is being a salesperson. Part of part of being a salesperson is telling them that they're right, that their inclination is right in what they want. And so, um, you know, in this situation, she had this church and she sent an email and got no response back, or got no response back. And I said, let's follow up. And basically, uh, my thought process was. You're going to, we're going to say what we can do for them. We're going to say we understand what their concerns might be, and we want to answer those concerns, so we want them to come back with some questions on what this would look like, and also that from a um, financial standpoint, it's going to make a whole lot more sense. I'm not going to put numbers in this. I'm not going to put how much money is going to make sense, but I'm basically trying to set up that I'm going to put them in a place where they're like, well, we need to meet to discuss this because you're going to sell it when you meet or when you talk on the phone. You're not going to sell in an email. Um, and just using really strong language of, I know you have questions uh, about some of these things I brought up. Why don't we talk more about this um, as, you know, it, as soon as possible? Avoid words like earliest convenience, uh, when you have time, because let's be honest, we all look at our lives and the first thing we think to ourselves is, I don't have any time for anything. Like for me personally, I barely have time to shower because I have two children under the age of four that take up most of my life and you know, if I get a chance to take a 20 minute shower, the heavens open up and angels start singing. Like that's just the reality we live in. And so when we say your convenience are in your lead, you know, at your earliest time, they're going to have the intention of being like, Oh yeah, I'll do that. And then all of a sudden four weeks go by. Well, there's no urgency in it. There wasn't a whole lot of like, let's get together. So when we craft an email, the language is more from a standpoint of, it's in your best interest to, to meet with us. We're not going to hard sell you on this, but we're going to tell you what your options are. We're going to tell you what we think is your best options, which allows them to feel like they, you know, they feel like they have a say in it and they feel like they, that somebody's looking up for their interests. They don't feel like somebody's just trying to be like, give me your business so that so and so doesn't get your business. Um, it comes across as like this thing of like, okay, this is a need we need filled. Let's go ahead and meet. And because of that, that leads to people saying, I'd be willing to sit down and talk to you. Or I'd be willing to sit on the phone and talk to you. Um, that's how you turn a no into a maybe to a yes. And so, you know, you got to get the fear language out of emails. Like you're, you're not in a place where you need to be fearful they're not going to respond. It's better to, I uh, kind of say to Chris on a regular basis, it's better to stick your foot in your mouth and not get the business than to not say something and not get the business because they're they're tepid on it. So I'd rather have you say, this is what I can do for you and I'm an expert in this field and it's probably a good idea for you to take my advice on this and even if you don't go with me, at least you have some good advice, than to sit there and go, well, I know you might be kind of looking for a website. I'm a web developer. I have a nice picture on my website. Doesn't that, does that work? You know, like, and I'm not saying that everybody has a problem with selling like that. It's just something that I know that we've struggled with a little bit is that kind of a, some people call it a, the killer approach, but I think of it more as like a really just taking the, just really focusing on this idea of they really do want your help. Just help them kind of get down the path to the next step. Um, Cause everybody's, in this spot of no time, you know, we're busy. Maybe we want the easy fix. Maybe we want whoever makes it um, easiest on us. But as you build those relationships, even in emails, it really builds that idea of like, I trust this person versus, well, I don't know what's different between her and her and him. So I'll just kind of point and click and see which one comes up. And so that's, that, that happens in email conversations because that's our first chance to actually touch base with people. Yeah, that's it. so it's basically, I mean, like using confident and decisive language, which is easier for me to do in writing than when I'm talking in person because I'm a people pleaser. So right. I don't want to step on toes right. or like, so it's like oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, we don't want to make people angry. Like, <laughs> That's our life. We don't want to like drive people away. Like, uh, you're so inept at this. Let me do this for you. Like, but we do also have to realize that like our skills are valuable and we live in a culture right now that's basically telling everybody that your skills are a dime a dozen. There's a, there's hundreds of web designers out there. 
well, web designer A might be somebody who customizes everything and takes real pride in their code and um, really wants to make unique websites that fit the personality of somebody. Why, you know, contractor B is fresh out of college and is going to find the coolest template they can find on WordPress and just dump information into it. Now, do I have an opinion one way or another on that? No, I'm not a web developer. I don't really have opinions on if one's good or one's bad, but what I do know is because I'm saying that, I know that most people in the world have no clue, <laughs> like, what's the difference between college student B who will do it for $1,000 less by just clicking on a template versus person A who is going to do all customized, um, you know, web development and is going to give me a much superior website. Well, a thousand dollars in that time in that frame doesn't really seem like much when you when you know the difference. But the only way you're going to be able to tell them that what that difference is is if you can get them into conversation. And so, um, you know, we're we're trying to build this place of building relationships and conversations. And if we talk, I think that like my wife hates when I do this. Okay, so I think like a lot of things through the ideas of dating. If I'm going to ask a girl out. When I asked my wife out, I didn't say, like, well, you know, if you're interested in a guy kind of like me who, you know, we can maybe have fun doing something. I don't have any real plans, but, you know, whatever. The chance of me getting a date probably just went out the window. Uh, if I go up to her and I say, like, hey, I think we, you know, it'd be really fun for us to spend some time together. Let's go do this. My chances go up. And that's what we're doing through email interaction is we're saying, this is why you want to go on a on a, a work date with me and not with that person. And so we're that's what we're really trying to focus on is this idea of like, if you're building a relationship, you gotta go with this mentality of like, I'm the best person for you to pick. And if you're not putting that out there, then you put yourself in this really awkward position of um, you know, they're either trying to feel out if you're confident in what you do, are you do you believe that you're good at what you do? And or they're going to think, well, I could probably get this person for a song because they don't have a whole lot of confidence, you know, and the more savvy business people. So, you know, my biggest thing is when it comes to communicating, especially via email, is you are the expert at what you do. You're trying to get that across without being uh, condescending or, or trying to say, like, you don't know what you're talking about, but you're trying to say, like, I know what I'm doing. I want to do the, the best thing for your business. And... You know, it's easy, as much as it seems scary when somebody's like, my budget's $2,000, and you're like, well, this is going to take three. If you can sell them on the idea of, like, you're the expert and this is the best for their business, they're going to find that money versus if you're going in and kind of like, well, I guess I, we could cut some corners and I can make this work for $2,000. Well, you're basically saying, like, well, what I'm telling you doesn't isn't really that big of a deal because I'm willing to cut corners on it. Um, you know? Some people still say, like, I can't spend that money, and you have to make concessions. But, you know, when you're doing those concessions, it probably makes more sense in any type of language barrier to be, like, from a standpoint of, like, eventually we need to do these steps. You know, we can start here, but we have to get to here. Um, and I know Christy's been finding out some clients as she's kind of looked through stuff that she's done for people in the past, and she's like, well, we said we were going to get to here, and they never got to here, and we really need to get their mobile site working and things like that. So. I'm kind of getting a little off topic, but it's all about confident language. And that starts in your writing. And confident language in writing often starts with writing from a very sound technical standpoint, um, which is not a characteristic that a lot of people like to have. Yeah, I think the dating analogy actually works well. You should tell Chrissy to let you keep using that one. <laughs> well, she can't relate too many things to dating. So I'm always just like, no, it's always about relationships. It's easier oh. to well, I've got uh, a, a couple of questions that I'm going to sort of roll into one, but let's say that you have an existing customer or a client you've already got a relationship with uh, and you're wanting to sell. Uh, you've got some sort of a new offering that you want to present and, and sell. Um, right. And so you're kind of, in a way, you're looking for a conversion in the email. Uh, what are your recommendations there? Um, my honest recommendation would be get on the phone. 
Um, <laughs> that seems weird for guys talking about writing. But um, if you were having an established relationship, unless your relationships have always been text-based, on emails, on messengers, you really don't communicate via phone, um, your client's going to believe you more if you talk to them. If you send them an email with like, here's a link to this thing, I think it'd be really cool for your website, um, you might have decent results. I wouldn't say it, it's impossible. Um, okay, think less of a particular, here's something that I think would be great for this client, I'm gonna pitch it in email, and more of a broader application product. So like a, a plugin okay. or a sale you've got going on. Okay, yeah. Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, you're gonna wanna present it as much as, um, you know, that's where you're gonna really kind of think through. There's gonna be some marketing components to that, like how you want that to look. You know, you're gonna to wanna to do a pretty formal, um, you know, almost like, I don't know, not you're gonna want a pretty formal looking email that's almost pitch based. Um, but you're gonna want components that are gonna, you know, if you're gonna send it out to like 200 people, you're limited in what you can do from the personal connection point. If you are gonna have templates that say like, connected as a landing page for this uh, you know, great um, product that's coming out, um, here's the reasons I think that you should take a look at it. I think it's gonna be really beneficial to your business. Connected below is, is, the, is a link to get there or even like a direct, you know, here's a image from that landing page. Your, your goal is you still got to connect with them on a personal level and you're getting them information. So we're still going to live by the rule of you don't want to write more than a half a page. You know, if you get into too sales pitchy, they're going to toss it because they're just going to be like, you're trying to sell me something. But if you're engaging in conversation, which is here are the things I think are important with, that this brings you. This is why it's going to be effective for your business. You're talking in the conversations A to B and it kind of can still be formed in a template to a degree where you're just filling in some information per client that you want to get it out to, but they still feel like, well, this isn't a mailer. This is a, you know, Carrie saying this is an Im important to our website, um, you know, because this is going to draw on some clientele from this aspect. And then they can make the decision of like, do they want that type of clientele, which, you know, maybe they do, maybe they don't, or, or do they feel like they might have something else that's more effective? The thing is, if they come back to you and like, well, we've also heard about this application, tell me the differences. You've engaged in a conversation that allows you to go either way, but you're the one helping them. So you're helping your business by doing that. If you just say like, here's this great application, let me know if you want it. Maybe a 10% rate, maybe. Um, if you can tell them why that's important for their business in a short piece and then have a here, connect to this, and then maybe after about a week, follow up, be like, hey, were you able to look at that app that I was talking to you about? I'd love to have a conversation with you about that if they haven't responded to it. Then you've really built yourself in a place, a, a, a kind of a power place of, um, they realize that you didn't just send out a mailer because you're, you're coming back to them a week later saying, hey, I sent this to you because I think specifically for you, this is great. Um, so you're really kind of building that this idea up of, it's for them, not just, uh, hey, there's this great app that can make me some money. Um, so, I mean, it's always, it still always revolves around this relationship aspect of communication. And so, as you write, you got you to gotta connect with them specifically, not, even if it's a need, um, even if I know I have a need for something, um, I still need somebody to make me believe that they're going to fulfill it the best. Um, if I need a new car, unless I'm like a, I have to have a Chevrolet or whatever, I'm going to shop. And when I shop, what happens is they tell me why they're the best, best fit for my family. That's what sells me. So it's not the car. Cause I can see a hundred emails about Camry's and, um, you know, escorts or whatever else car comes up on my, from doing a few searches, nothing's going to sell me as much as the person who can say, this is why this fits you best. Even when I do my homework, the salesman has some work to do. Um, you're the salesman. So you got to put in that little bit of work, which is, this is why this works for you. Those blanket approaches of, 
here's this cool template that makes it look great. I'm sure you'll get some hits on that, but you're really going to really see the better turnover of, hey, I'm looking out for you specifically. This makes sense for you. And that's where that turnover comes. That's where you're going to see that turnover come up. Give away the value, even <laughs> when you're making the sale. Right. Um, I'm laughing at some of the Twitter comments about my name being Sue. Uh, so what are some of the, uh, and maybe this would be from your experience as an English teacher or maybe from your experience in, in, uh, in business, but what are some of the worst offenders you see uh, communication wise that, you pointed out some, some phrases earlier and that was really helpful. Yeah. Matt, what are some of the things that you see people doing all the time? You're like, ah, don't quit. Um, it. it can be written or, or verbal. Yeah. He, here's, I mean, I have a long list. I'm an English teacher, so I'm offended easily. Um, so my biggest one with my students is, is this, I call it, there's a difference between writing like you're in, talking to your friend in the hallway and there's, and then there's writing like you're talking to your teacher. Um, I don't, Nobody, there's not a single person, it doesn't matter how good a relationship you have with anybody out there. You might be friends who hang out on the weekends and, you know, go to the bar together. It doesn't matter. If you send them an email that has a bunch of slang and jargon in it that doesn't fit what you're talking about, your credibility tanks. It's just the reality of it. And, it, you know, like in those really tight relationships, like maybe they'll use you no matter what. Um, but... What happens is you find that that starts bleeding into your other writing. Like you sit there and you start, oh yeah, it's just it's just uh, just Tom over here. Like we talk like this all the time. That's great, but you know, Bill, this is his second contact to you ever, and you're talking. You know, you're you're using very informal language. Yeah, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna crank this up a notch on your web website, and it's gonna kick butt and blah blah blah. And you're like, yeah, this is you know. I'm telling you how awesome it's going to be. Well, the problem is they see that and they're like, is this person taking themselves seriously? Or do they believe in what they're doing? So when I have students who hand in papers and they have what I call, you know, hallway language, I would just be like, I can, I can tell you read what I've asked you to read. I can't tell if you've processed any of the ideas I've told you to process. Like, what's the significance of it? You know, words like the word like, oh, that word kills me. It's like this. It is what it is. It's not like anything. You know, you don't want to use those kind of words. Um, we want to be we want to be pretty clean and crisp with our writing as much as possible. You don't have to write like super eloquent, you know, like you're giving a speech for the Nobel Prize kind of sentences, but you really have to hit the nail on the head of like, I'm an English teacher. I use words that people look at me and go like, why did you use that? So like, I think I said the word magnanimous to my wife the other day and she just stared at me and I said, I meant grateful. Sorry. Like, you know, like I didn't, I know you don't really want me using these big words. I don't have, if I put that in email, somebody's going to think I'm a snob, but if I'm, I can still say the same thing and be on point and be able to say like, this is why it's important. Be very clean on it. Present myself. Like I take myself seriously, present myself. Like what I do is a serious thing. I will say this from my experience with dating my wife, married to my wife, all this stuff. I struggle with a long time to think, do web, do web designers take themselves seriously? They have their own lingo. They write very, you know, like when my wife, wife would write emails to clients, they'd be very like informal and very kind of like friendly. And is it bad to be friendly? No. But these people, regardless of how good a relationship you have when they come into town and you go out to dinner or any of those things, if they're seeing – information coming into them that is talking to them like you've been childhood friends and you're not, they're going to be like, does this person just think they're in college? Like, you know, like you do good work. So yeah, I guess I'm going to tolerate it, but you're going to forge long-term relationships by, you know, you're investing in who they are and you're taking interest in what they do. And you're, you can still ask the questions of, um, how's your wife or, I think, you know, is your daughter starting college this year or whatever, like where you build that rapport up, but you're going to do it like you're going to a business meeting. You're going to do it like you're in a formal office. And the moment you start taking yourself in, into the bar or you start taking yourself into uh, even the street and 
talk like you do then, you kill your credibility. And uh, for me, the big things are just being super aware of what you're saying on a regular basis. Um, it's because it's easy to fall into traps. We get in these. We say the same things regularly. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I have some students that when they talk, I I, I would have a cl I had a clicker, and I would click off how many times they say like while they're talking. Okay, that was an eleven like sentence. Like we've got to fix this problem. Those are things that we as a communicator we we're, we're never told when we're growing up. A big part of whatever you do is you're a communicator. That's your job. Whether it be your body language, whether it be what comes out of your mouth, whether it be you smile or you grimace at the right times, all these things are communication, how you write matters. And so we get in these bad habits of it doesn't matter. I mean I'm telling them what they need to what I need to tell them. Um, it it does matter. Um, people who take themselves seriously and these business owners are taking themselves seriously. They do not want to see their businesses fail. They don't want to be be okay at business. They want to be good at business. And if you, it might work for a little while, but those are the clients that you see that only come back one time. You did a nice website for me, but you know, you didn't do one of two things. You didn't invest in them enough and know much about them, or you treat them like they're just a one-off and you're very informal and you didn't want to improve that relationship. And so those kind of relationships where you can kind of talk in that slang, take time. And that saying that you'll never get to that place with some clients, but that's like a 10 year client. That's not a, a one year client. And so if you're talking, if you're always using that vernacular, if you're always talking in that, that type of lingo, um, you're going to find that a lot of those people are going to be kind of put off. Um, even more than the English teacher on a bad essay. Like, they're just going to kind of feel like, a certain time I communicate with them, I just kind of seemed, you know, like, yeah, that's cool. Like, you don't need to ever say that's cool. Like, ever. Like, that's a great idea. Or, you know, that's something for us to think about. Always carry yourself in a, a, a professional manner. Um, those are the big things for me. Like, so when they, my kids write to me, I say, you are writing to me. I know more than you do, so you better respect that. So telling me that, you know, if you're writing to me like I am clueless and you're just writing a bunch of like random stuff just to try to pretend like you knew what you're reading, I'm going to know because I've read this and I've studied this. Um, you can't pull one past me. And that's the same thing with your clients is they know their businesses. So if you start trying to throw out randomness in like very informal ways, they're going to know pretty quickly like I don't think you get me as well as you think you do. You know, the exception to the rule is if you're an undercover cop, right? and then sometimes you have to be street. You do. That's it's true. Down. I, I agree. I mean, you know, if you're undercover, you better be committing. That's all it comes down to in the end. <laughs> oh, we've got a few minutes left together. If, uh, if anybody who's tuning in live right now, if you want to get your question in, go ahead and do that. Um, you have been listening to episode 115, and if you missed the very beginning of the show, uh, episode 116 next week will be the end of season two of the podcast. Uh, I will be rebooting that later this fall with, uh, with some new ideas. I'm going to try out on you that I hope you will love. Uh, what else or something else I needed to say? In that? Oh, yeah, and the Office Hours community. It is now free. Go check that out, my.officehours.fm. Join in the conversation there. Uh, okay, so we've, uh, we've talked about some, some pet peeves. We've talked about some tips um, for written emails. Uh, what have we, any other uh, things just stand out in your mind of, oh my gosh, if I could tell people to, to, to do this when they communicate, it's... Um. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I think every company, or in like for a lot of your listeners, uh, places that could be contractors, you need to have a communication plan. It sounds really ridiculous. <laughs> like you think to yourself, like, who had plans to communicate? Like, that's the problem. Um, like, you should have a kind of a set idea of like how you want to go about what you're trying to do. 
If you don't, the problem is, is you're always doing what I think are called knee-jerk reaction responses. Like you're just trying to respond. Um, you have the people who will do the 24-hour rule. You have some people who do it like right out the gate, like, oh, I just got this email. I got to say, say something to them so they think I'm paying attention or, or any of those things. If you have a plan, it's great. So as a teacher, I have what's called a 24-hour rule. I, when a parent emails me, I have 24 hours to respond, right? So sometimes you get crazy, frantic parents who think something, the world's coming in because of a grade, or you have other parents who just want to check in on their kid and make sure they're doing fine, or other parents who are just like, you know, so-and-so said this happened in class, what's going on? Um, but by having that plan set, like how I was going to communicate, allowed, allowed me the space to, one, communicate that to parents, right? Hey, if I don't get back to you in like a day, do not freak out. Like, I am on board with you, right? Um, you know, most businesses have the conventional 24 to 48 hour kind of window where it makes sense. I also know that, you know, especially in design, it moves a little quicker. So when you send out an email, you're like, well, I'm gonna have to wait for this response before I can move on to this. So I need it quickly. Um, a lot of times what I like to say is like, if you have a plan in your head, like what, how you are gonna communicate, you can communicate that to your clients. Hey, if you send me an email, Typically, I respond within four hours. If you don't hear from me in four hours, then hit me back again. Um, or, hey, when I get a, you know, when I send you an email, like, just know that during this process, if I send you an email during the day that says I need something, I need that within four to six hours or 24 hours. Because if I'm asking for something, I'm pretty much at a standstill until I get it. So that that's one aspect of having a plan that's really beneficial. And the other is you really just have to have a plan of, all communications as almost like a subsection of your business. So for Chrissy, I basically tell her she needs to dedicate so much hour per week to communications specifically. It's not client relations. I know like a lot of people like to throw in that client relations aspect. Um, could be following up with new leads. Could be following up with leads that we haven't heard back from the people in a little while. It could be um, just touching base with the client like, hey, how's that working out? Like what's going on there? All those things are important aspects, and especially the how are things going since I've delivered on this is one that people just don't do. Like they're like, oh, it's launched, I'm done with it. As my wife likes to say in the last two days of every website she's working on, dear Lord, I just want to get rid of this website. I'm, I don't care how cool it is, I'm done with it. You know, um, which I, it makes sense to me because been work, she's working on it for so many hours. Uh, but her first inclination isn't to check in with that client in a week and be like, how do you like it? Have you found any glitches that you haven't been able to communicate to me yet? Or is there something that you're like, as a designer, I know that adds more time and you're getting paid in a certain way. So you want to be careful about like how open the door you're like, what changes do you want? Uh, Cause you might get a flood. Um, but you know, you do want to kind of follow up like, even if it's like a, you know, you've had it for a week or you've had it for a month. What, you know, what are you, what are you seeing? That's how you keep that client relationship going, is by doing that kind of thing. So if I tell a parent, this is how Tommy's doing on, right now in my class, he's got a, a B minus, and they want him to have an A, and then I don't email them for the rest of the quarter, and then the last day of the quarter I go, he got a B. Mom and dad are mad, and they are on my case. Now if I send an email every two weeks just saying like, he's not turning in homework, which is really affecting him, or he's, you know, I've seen that his writing's really gone downhill, I'm not sure if something's going on, then when I say he got to be, mom and dad go, well, you know, we kind of knew this was coming. It's okay, you know. I kind of look at it in the same way in the business world of, if you want relationships to last, you've got to put in the time of not just saying, okay, now that I'm doing something for you that makes me money at this moment, I'll talk to you. But once that's delivered, well, contact me when you need something else. Like, you want to cultivate those businesses by having check-ins. Sometimes those can be form emails. Hey, was just thinking about you today, or your company today. How are things going? How's you know how's the website been working? And they may come back and say like, you know, we didn't think at the time that we need to make this mobile, but now we're finding out a lot of our clients are looking at mobile. It leads you right into that conversation of, well, this is what it would take to make this mobile, and how this is how much it costs. It probably take me this many days, and we can have that problem fixed. Versus, you haven't heard from them in two years. They want to make their website mobile, and they're like, well, they haven't talked to me in two years, so I'm just going to go to so-and-so just down the street that I met who does web design and they can get that done. 
that's a problem that Chrissy ran into is when she was at a previous company, she had a client, their website wasn't mobile. She all of a sudden, when she got North going, was like, she really talked to him about getting that mobile. By the time she contacted him, she missed the, the window by about two weeks that they already contacted someone else to do it. Well, that wasn't really necessarily her fault from the standpoint of she's changing companies, but um, it was a problem from the standpoint of her previous employer didn't keep up the communications to be aware that that was going to be an issue that needed to be fixed or something that they were thinking about. And so by the time she got there, she was out of luck. And so that's how we cultivate those. So my big thing is communication plans are huge. How am I going to do this? These are my, e I for sure email, these are my form emails, these are my telephone calls, these are the things I make, need to make sure I follow up on. And it's going to feel like a, I, I always tell my wife this, it's going to feel like a tidal wave at first because you're just initiating the plan. But once that's set up, all of a sudden it's really quick. It's like, okay, this is response to that. That's a form letter, click, type in the name, send. That took me 15 seconds. Um, or, oh, I have on my calendar to follow up with this company. I only really need to write a three, three to four sentence email. That takes 30 seconds to a minute. Send it off. You know what? If they respond, when they, res you know, if you write it right, they're going to respond. Things are good. Thanks for checking in. We'll let you know if something comes up that we need. Great. But you're still going to follow up in six months or four months or whatever your plan is. Um, I think of it kind of the same as writing an essay. When I tell my kids to write an essay, if I say, just go write this essay, I will guarantee you 90% of them will be awful. Just awful. If I say, we're going to write an essay, the rough drafts do here. Um, we're going to do some peer review here. We're going to do this here. It kind of sets them in this place where they're like, okay, well, I have to have it done by here. And I have to, and I don't want to be embarrassed for my friends here. So I'm going to put in the work and get this done. The next three times I write the essay, it's a whole lot easier. Nobody's cramming at the last second. They're better essays. They get the grades they want. Everybody get, is a little bit happier. Seems weird that, to think that things we learned in school actually apply to real life, but <laughs> they actually do. Oh well, that is uh, that is an excellent piece of advice to uh, to end on there. Um, another hour has flown by, and you have been listening to Office Hours FM. Travis, thank you so much for uh, coming on today, sharing your classroom. Uh, knowledge with us. Where can people uh, follow up with you online to say hello? Um, you know, you can find me on Twitter if you like sports, because um, that's usually what my Twitter handle's for, at Tito Vandy. Um, you can also, uh, I, I have a LinkedIn page that you can connect with me for, as far as from a more professional standpoint. Um, I believe that might be Tito Vandy as well. I Maybe not. I'm not sure. Um, I'm pretty sure it's Tito Vandy as well as what you can find it under. And then you can also find me at Travis at NorthUXDesign.com, uh, our company here, uh, for any follow-ups as far as uh, if you have some specific questions on um, ways to kind of, you know, things we didn't get into is how to broach the things like a difficult client, how can you kind of put your foot down without being a jerk kind of stuff, um, those kind of things that happen in emails often. We didn't quite get into those kind of, those kind of questions, but... If you have questions like that, yeah, uh, Travis at NorthUXDesign.com. Uh, that's the best place, place to get me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Travis. Uh, and thanks to you guys who have tuned in. I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.